Members, we'll get started here. Uh, we don't have a quorum quite yet, um, so we'll do wait till we then till we can do the minutes. Um, we've our agenda today is uh, we have the board of cosmetology in front of us, and uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. My name is uh, Gina Fast. I will apologize in advance if I'm coughing horribly. I have a double ear infection and a sinus infection. So just give me a minute if I need to take a drink. Oh, you're going to turn me up. All right. So the committee asked uh, for me to be here today. And if you'd like me to start on the projector behind me, the IT project update. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure kind of the direction you'd like me to begin. Um, why don't we start with start with that? I know that's that was an issue and uh, um, that came up with this over the summer, and so why don't we start with that? Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I said, uh, my name is Gina Fast. I'm the executive director for the Minnesota Board of Cosmetology, and I'm here today to give you an update on the projects that were submitted through the ITA, otherwise known as Odyssey process, at the end of last fiscal year. Uh, <clears throat> the board requested uh, two uh, two areas of projects. One would be considered external facing and the second being considered internal facing. Um, you'll find here that uh, we were planning, we're planning to display inspection reports online as well as discipline uh, orders online. And the second area on the external facing was to allow uh, licensees to transfer um, a call, it's called the certification of licensure from state to state. Um, request this on our website and it be sent um, automatically to the state board um, that they're hoping to be, it be sent to such as Wisconsin, California, et cetera. And this would all uh, be able to be done online and expedi uh, expedite the process for them. We currently do this, but it's done manually. Um, the next set of projects, which are the internal facing projects, is um, internal onboarding and HR. And this was to create an automated process for agency specific onboarding. Um, this would include, uh, include routing of applications, reviews, um, email notifications uh, to applicants and uh, the staff, completion of uh, the various HR required forms, the trainings, um, creatinence and maintenance of HR folders, uh, uh, having a proper retention schedule, electronic retention schedule of both personnel and supervisory files, things that might include ID badges, emergency contact information, uh, plan step increase, step reviews and increases. Um, we also uh, are looking to create um, a complaint process that is configured um, with rules in our database. Uh, currently our complaint uh, system is more of a data entry. There's not any rules uh, built around it. This would help with workflows, route complaints, generate emails to uh, either the people, uh, the respondents of the complaint or the complainants itself. Um, and the last one, <coughs> the last one was uh, purchasing and that was to create an automated uh, purchasing process from our office to the administrative services unit and then once the goods were purchased, is to catalog it and uh, have it come back to the board. Those were the initial approaches of the, of the, the, the projects. Um, so in July, uh, just to kind of uh, set out where, kind of with the neck coming up on the next slide, is that um, the LAC requested that uh, in July of 2019 through March of 2020, that we limit our focus, or, or I shouldn't say limit, that's negative and it's not negative, to just have our focus on requirements gathering, developing statements of work and other planning preparations for the projects that I had just described. Um, we have worked hand in hand with Minute leadership, uh, Minute staff, as well as a Minute business analyst to gather, the to, gather the docu to gather and document the requirements of these processes. Um, the process with Minute has been extremely positive and we plan to continue to uh, leverage Minute uh, business analysts um, as we work through technology initiatives. So it's been very, very, um, very good for, I think, uh, both agencies. Um, so we have a bit of an updated approach. Uh, I can give you a little bit of background first. Um, since the, the, this process starts in January of roughly, it started in January of 19, and it makes its way through Minute, and then it gets to the LAC. and. Um, I believe most of you are familiar that the 
uh, Board of Cosmetology is housed uh, in a conglomerate kind of with the health licensing boards. Um, and we had an administrative services unit that would su uh, support our purchasing um, and, and other items. And that unit has basically, we have transferred along with all of the health boards from the administrative services unit to SMART, um, which is under the Department of Administration. So that transpired roughly, and we started that process in August. All the boards did in August of um, 2019. Uh, financials went first, and then HR is was starting in January. So we've been um, very excited about this transition, and so far it's been extremely uh, rewarding and positive. So um, that's where we all are. So there's a few tweaks to this because of that. Um, so where we're at today, and this will give you a sense of each of the projects, the dollar amount that was requested under each of the projects and where we are. So the online inspection reports and orders, the requirements with minute are completed. And the next step would be to issue either an RFP to look at an enterprise solution that would exist amongst the enterprise um, with Minute, um, or to leverage an existing solution that the board already has, and that would all be done with developer staff augmentation. So it would be taking the requirements that was gathered by the Minute business analyst and moving them over to development. And in the, the conversations um, will be partnered with Minute to determine if it's an RFP um, looking at the enterprise solution or to uh, leverage existing solutions. Uh, and the certificate of licensure has had high level requirements done and we're working with Minute to validate that the certificates of licensure can be utilized in the enterprise wide solution. Um, internal onboarding and HR is also, uh, that's nearing completion by the end of next week, the 28th of February. And that is also in a similar uh, a pattern of whether it's an RFP, enterprise solution, or leveraging an existing solution. Um, as same as the, in the complaint process, as well as the same. Uh, the purchasing, the project has been closed because uh, the Department of Administration, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, uh, testimony, we're now with uh, SMART, and they have their own uh, purchasing system. It's called EOR. I don't know what EOR stands for, um, but that completely meets the needs of what we were hoping to achieve when we started this process back in Jan uh, January of 19. So we don't, we no longer need a purchasing solution. So, so uh, yeah, okay. I was making sure I was on the same slides because yep, yep. I'm going back and forth here. So that is the update I have, and I'm happy to answer questions related to that. Well, I guess the first question I have um, is fast is last year when you were before us and talked, you know, we were, you were asked about, mentioned, we asked about projects and why weren't this, wasn't this mentioned to us last year? Because it was kind of, I know there was some discussion that had to do with the, having to do with the lawsuit and the bill we, that was forward to mm -hmm. um, deregulate the hair braiders because of the court case that we <laughs> lost the state. And uh, you, you told us that it was going to cost you $21,000 and you didn't have that money and then it was kind of a shock mm -hmm. after session was over in the summer when you asked to transfer 450 mm -hmm. I think somewhere around $450,000 into the Odyssey Fund yep. to do this project and we it was kind of a shock to all of us that number one that you know that's IT work that you said you had to get done to do the uh, to deregulate the braider the braiders um, and yet also, there's four hundred fifty thousand dollars that you had spent that that you're planning on spending on this project with that we hadn't even heard anything about. So mm -hmm. it's, it was kind of confusing to us mm -hmm. last um, last year. That's why, like I said, we asked that before you proceed with it that mm -hmm. you uh, do the planning piece of it, but not to start spending the money, be, you know, because we wanted to know what was going to go on. I know there was uh, some other people that. We're inclined to say, well, just let the money go. Like it's supposed to go back to the general fund when money's unspent in a department. So uh, I guess that's the question I have. Why weren't we told about this last year? Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, thank you. So this would have been, I believe, the second time the board has requested um, money to be transferred into Odyssey. And um, I, w I routinely, um, well, as a part of the uh, health licensing board structure, we have a IT governance committee where we discuss these things. And um, to be quite honest, I mean, 
the other boards generally aren't mentioning this in their legislative oversight and or their legislative testimony. And so it's not something that I intentionally left off. It's not something that I'm aware that Minute has recommended we um, we present in our overviews if that's, I mean, lessons learned. And if that's something the committee would like to see, I'm happy to have conversations about what we're doing. I would I would need to consult with Minute because as we submit paperwork, just because we submitted in, I think it was in March of 19 when our paperwork actually was submitted into Minute, um, it goes through their process before it's approved. And Minute could have denied the request before it even went to the LAC. So they're, I don't know if it's part of its uh, timing, like you know, chicken before the egg, carp before the horse, um, as well as when we're doing fiscal notes. Um, and there, this was a conversation, and maybe we have to talk to MMB to do it better, is that the LAC hasn't decided on these until I think we don't get the notification until about July. So we're not, it's, it, it, it appeared to be two separate conversations than one together, but I'm happy to try to work with yourself or the, the, the staff here to better um, have those conversations. And it was not my intent to be um, disrespectful or to, to not be uh, forthcoming. So I apologize if that was taken the wrong way. Well, Ms. Fast, some of, the, some of this is that part of our job, and especially in the budget year when we're setting a budget up for all the departments and, and whatnot, it, uh, it, uh, we need to know this stuff that where there's gonna be spending because mm -hmm. we're re ultimately responsible, mm -hmm. our committee, of overseeing that. And it's, so it was, like I said, it was kind of a, came out mm -hmm. of left field afterwards that, mm -hmm. especially when early in session when you when you were before us and, and when the, the bill was there before for the deregulation mm -hmm. that you came and said, you said that you didn't have the $21,000 mm -hmm. to do that minor reprogramming to take mm -hmm. them off your system. And yet then you come forward at the mm -hmm. end of session with this chunk of money that now, now I've got this time, I want to put an odyssey for IT work, and it's like, it just set up some red flags. Uh, Representative Albright, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I'm gonna follow up first with the, the question that uh, Chair Nelson. So this money was appropriated, as near as I can tell, uh, three years ago. So what in the budget from three years ago did you not utilize that $450,000 for? Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, so um, the board has grown over the last uh, few years, and one of the things that we're working with, and we're working um, hand in hand with the Department of Administration, is the uh, is is the turnover and leaves of absences. So one of the uh, struggles, it's not a struggle. We have um, we've had we had a staffer go on uh, uh, extended military leave. And so that entire salary is um, not spent. Uh, we had another staffer um, go on uh, 12 weeks of unpaid FMLA leave followed by a one year leave of absence. And we were notified every four weeks whether or not the staffer was gonna come back. And so what happens in, and then we have turnover um, with the administrative services unit and some of the gaps that we had uh, through HR uh, filling vacancies would take months and months and months. Getting positions approved would take months. Um, and so we're navigating this, um, this path of, well, we have someone on a leave of absence that we're getting every four weeks. I can't post a position because if I fill them and they come back, then now I have two positions. I, it's not in the budget to afford the two positions based on what the financial staff are telling me. And then I would end up with layoffs or I would end up with being overspent. So it's a balance of trying to figure that out and I know we can do better and that's what our, we're hoping with SMART as well and to have better human resources service, things people leave, Positions are getting posted within seconds and days. I mean, it's it's a completely di we're in a completely different um, process that we're hoping can avoid some of those. I would take any suggestions from the committee on leaves of absences and small agencies. They're very very difficult to navigate. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Did the BCE issue an RFP for a marketing agency in 2019? Mr. Bast. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yes, we did. And what was the budget? What was the budget for that? Uh, Seventy thousand dollars. Did you sign the contract, Ms. Fast? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I would say I signed it, and the Demar Department of Administration would have. There might be another signer on it. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are Are you aware of the Minnesota statute 15.057? Uh, Mr. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yes, we are. And, and how, in light of your activities with regard to an RFP to a marketing agency, do you square with that statute? Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chairs and members of the committee, uh, the Department of Administration would be the entity that would have approved the RFP, and according to them, the contract falls into the realm of fulfilling our statutory function, and it's within the normal course of business. They basically state that someone should not speak with authority for the agency, such as them sitting here today, um, or that they would speak on behalf. Um, but things like doing marketing, um, and the contract is in the ordinary course of business exception. This is how the Department of Administration, that unit, interprets the statute, and they would not have raised questions on the document we submitted to them. Mr. Representative Chair. Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to go back a couple years, and I understand in looking at uh, your, your budget, you made some expenditures to Goff Public in fiscal year 17. Is that true? Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members, yes, we did. Representative Albright. Sure. Thank you. Um, what was the nature of those payments? Ms. Fast. Mr. Chair and members, I don't have that in front of me, but if I recall, they did uh, training for all of the staff at the office. Representative Albright. Mr. Chair. I understand that there have been some sizable expenditures for outdoor advertising on the building, uh, principally a large sign on the side of the BCE's building. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how much that cost? Ms. Fast. Mr. Chair and members, I don't have that cost in front of me. Representative Albright. Sure, I think it would be relevant in light of the, the costing that we we're discussing if uh, they would uh, provide that uh, uh, costing invoice to the chair of the committee. Um, I find it troubling uh, for the sake of uh, what we've been talking about, and I think Chair Nelson, rightly so, brought up a number of uh, uh, points as well as what we've just gone through. Some might discuss, uh, describe them as irregularities. I might describe them as, as maybe being dereliction um, with regard to the focal point of your organization to administer uh, an oversight to cosmetologists. Uh, two years ago, you asked for money to move into a larger uh, space. Uh, by all reckoning, that was a space that you could have stayed in and renovated it and brought more furniture into rather than, you know, than do what you did. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned by the manner in which this board has operated, Mr. Chair. Um, the irregularities have been going on for several years. Uh, I do hope that we'll take uh, time as we move forward uh, to scrutinize their uh, efforts with greater clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fast, if you want to respond or... Um, uh, Mr. Chair, you know, in terms of the move, I can also tell you now the Board of Nursing has moved out of the space due to the issues with the landlord. Um, and so we are not the only board to have moved out. The rest of the boards are working with the Department of Administration right now um, through an RFP process. Uh, I don't know what their decision will be, but we are not the only board to have moved out of the space. Representative Vogel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My relative to this uh, discussion, you may not know this offhand, but you can maybe get back to me. I'm just curious how many FTEs you have, how many square feet you're occupying, and what is your occupancy expense for that? rent and so forth. Ms. Fast. Mr. Chair, members, I, let me, I, make sure, I don't know if I heard all the questions. The first is your F, my FTE count. Yep. So the uh, current, as of, the, as of this morning, we have 25 FTEs, we have two offers out, and three vacancies. So that will get us to 20, like close to right around 29. So Ms. Fast, the, when you say you got two offers out, does that mean you got five vacancies or three vacancies? 
when you say you got two offers out? We would have five vacancies as of today with okay. two offers uh, waiting, going through the process. Gotcha. Representative Vogel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, the, the other thing was the, uh, the number of square feet that you occupy as well as your occupancy expense, which would be the rent, basically, and the depreciation on the equipment or whatever, however that's figured. Ms. Fast. Mr. Chair, um, in terms of the square feet, um, I would I would like to get back to you on that to be um, to make sure I'm correct as well as the um, the rent, and that would have all been set within the Department of Administration's guidelines of square footage. Representative Boulder. But we can get back to you. Any further questions so far, um, Ms. Fast? If you want to continue with your uh, pre more presentation or. Um, where are we at with as far as the IT stuff now? Are you ready to move on? And I see if Mr. Eichten came here. Maybe he can help with questions of, I, I saw him. I thought I saw him come. There he is. <laughs> if there's any questions about where we're at with that, whether um, we've had to talk yesterday, the uh, minute was in front of us, and, and the um, Blue Ribbon panel was in front of us talking about IT questions about buy versus build and uh, all that stuff. and. I'm just curious where we're at with that. And before we start, yeah, we, we now have a quorum, so thank you, Representative Quam. Um, we have two sets of minutes here, and Representative Elkins, uh, we have the minutes from the 18th and the minutes from the 19th, February 18th and February 19th. Can we move both of them at the same time? No. Okay, so we'll move the uh, uh, minutes of the 18th first. Um, minutes from the 18th have been, mo have been moved. To be accepted, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> minutes are accepted. I'll and move the approval of the minutes of February 19th. The motion has been made to move, approve the minutes of the February 19th, 2020. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Eichen, and yeah. sorry about the inter interruption there. No, th thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. For the record, my name is John Eichen. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Minnesota IT Services. Um, in keeping with the commitment that was made, I suppose late, well, sometime last year, um, we entered into a requirements gathering and planning phase around uh, the board's proposed work using the, the information telecommunications account dollars. So we assigned a uh, business analyst and a project manager to help gather those requirements. Uh, they engaged over several months with the board. It was a very good working relationship. Um, we are now coming to the end of that requirements gathering phase. And we've, as you can see up here, it's a few different paths uh, for the various um, proposals that we've been looking at. One would look at a, the enterprise solution for uh, electronic licensing. This is built on the Salesforce platform. It's hosted out of a center of excellence at Deed. Um, we're also looking at potentially building out some additional functionality in an existing solution for the board. This is GL Suites. And then the other option would be to actually issue an RFP to see what other solutions might be out there. In the next month or so, we need to finalize uh, that solution strategy around the work and then um, move forward into an execution phase, likely later in the spring. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about where we stand. I will call it the last one, I, and I missed the earlier testimony, maybe it already been mentioned, around purchasing with the move to smart. There's an existing system called EOR that handles um, these purchase orders and, and needs on the front end before they get into SWIFT, the accounting system. So with the move to SMART, the board can take advantage of that system. That eliminates um, one of the potential projects that was being looked at here. Mr. Director, what does EOR stand for? I think I should, <laughs> we're all kind of Electronic laughing at that. Invoicing. Invoicing and rec, uh, requisitions. I don't know what the O stands for. It's E-I-O-R, but it's essentially a requisition system so you can see um, uh, various agencies essentially use different flavors of a parent system that was initially developed by the Department of Human Services. At, uh, at our agency, we call it CPRIS, which is a centralized purchasing and requisition system. Uh, admin has just a slightly different flavor of it that they call EOR. Oh, thank but you. It's, it's yeah. not a grumpy old. Uh, <laughs> it's not a grumpy old uh, donkey yet. <laughs> Oh, Thinking back to my, my when my kids were young, anyway. It's it's not a super <laughs> sophisticated modern, you know, like a Salesforce platform. It's it's a homegrown tool, but it it meets the needs very well in terms of making sure that um, all the the 
I's are dotted and T's are crossed before a, a requisition actually occurs. Representative Claiborne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh. Uh, there are some issues that were, um, so as you know, I'm new to the committee and I wasn't here when all of these projects were discussed. Um, at some point, as we're going through this discussion, I would like to really discuss the costs and how we got to these costs. They seem a very, uh, a bit extended to me or high to me. So I would just like to have a better understanding of where that's coming from. Right. So. Mr. Chair, I can speak to this a little bit, which just in the general. Mr. Eichen or Ms. Vast, yeah. Thank you. In the general context of, of the Odyssey account, when dollars move into the account, it's usually in a pretty early stage of planning. There's a concept that's been developed, you know, a, a rough, high-level set of requirements, but not the kind of detail you would need to arrive at a cost estimate that you're going to feel a great degree of confidence around. So as the process moves forward, you know, if an RFP were to be issued, we would see cost proposals come back from vendors. Um, or if we went more of an acquisition route and we, we knew exactly who we wanted and we could use some of the master contract programs that exist, we would bring that vendor in, develop a statement of work and a, and a cost estimate associated with that. Any dollars that are not used, these are essentially the amounts that were transferred. They're not necessarily the budget for each of the projects. When the budget's finalized, we'll, we'll move into an execution phase. Whatever dollars aren't spent on these projects will cancel back to the fund of origin. Um, and that means not the fund at the board, but I believe it's a, sp a special fund. revenue or general, general. Oh, your general, yep. general fund. So uh, if that doesn't, any dollars after four years automatically cancel back. But once we know the project is done, uh, if there are remaining dollars, we'll just go ahead and cancel those back. And that was uh, put into law in 2016, just to be clear, when uh, sort of a set of uh, reforms were put in around this information telecommunications account to give the Legislative Advisory Commission the ability to um, essentially block a transfer. And then the lapse provision was added at that time because it was a little unclear in statute what happened to dollars that remained in these accounts after the projects were done. Representative Claiborne. Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. These questions are probably for Mr. Eichton, but um, we've got a, a bunch of these health-related uh, regulatory boards. Uh, this one, Board of Nursing, Emergency Services Regulatory Board that uh, Representative Hewitt is following closely, pharmacy. Um, it, at some fundamental you know, application level, a license is a license. <clears throat> would, it, would it make sense to consolidate the administration of most of these licensures onto a common platform to, you know, achieve some economies of, of scale and uh, setting these up and keeping them maintained? Mr. Reitgen. Uh Mr. Chair, Representative Elkins, yes. And that's the direction that we've been moving. I believe the Board of Dentistry, the Board of Pharmacy, the Board of Nursing, Board of Psych Psych or, I'm sorry, Psychology, I believe. And then us. And are all are moving on to the Salesforce basic.gov platform. Yeah. So that's our enterprise solution for e-licensing. Not every state license is, is provided through that system. There are uh, legacy systems in use. GL Suites is one I mentioned that the health licensing boards use. Um, or ALIMS, yes, yeah. that's, that's the name. Uh, but over time, we'd like to move as many entities as possible onto that Salesforce platform. I will say the ongoing licensing cost has been a struggle for mm -hmm. some entities that, um, you know, it's a very solid modern platform with a lot of components. Essentially, you can, Salesforce has a library of components that you can go in and uh, configure for your needs. And then over time, they're upgrading, they're investing in their platform, and we can take advantage of that. But we do need to reach a critical mass on that uh, platform before the ongoing licensing costs start to come down and be more manageable. Mm -hmm. So we're in that, that sort of bubble phase right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's the direction we'd like to move. Representative yeah. Elkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A follow up. So are, are um, all of these boards uh, under the supervision of the same chief business technology officer? Mr. Eichen. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. They're all under the supervision of Dan Ross. He's our chief business technology officer, actually, for the health licensing boards, the Pollution Control Agency, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and the Minnesota Geospatial Information Office. Dan's a, a veteran of the state, um, and we we look 
for a lot. We look to get a lot from him for in terms of uh, technology leadership. So he's got a full plate of agencies to support. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, pre-consolidation, some of these entities did not have any, you know, chief information officer, or executive level technology person. Um, we're, we leverage the folks that we have to serve multiple agencies. Yeah, and then I'll just follow up one more. One more. Okay. So, um, so he's basically like the CBTO for the small agencies, basically. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Elkins, we actually have another CBTO, Stephanie Horvath, who is okay. previous, well, is still, she's a Brigadier General in the Minnesota National Guard. She's also a uh, Chief Business Technology Officer for Minute. She serves what we refer to as the MBCCs, which is the Minnesota Boards, Councils, and Commissions. Mm -hmm. So she has all the small entities aside from what Mr. Ross has, which are the health licensing boards. So she has the Ombudsman for Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities, Office of Administrative Hearings, um, a host of other small boards and councils and commissions. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, does that, does that include the campaign finance board? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Wright. Did. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, they are excluded from consolidation uh, per the consolidation law 16E.016. So I, I raised that President because Elkins. basically the campaign finance board is uh, two company computer guys with the server in the closet, and that's something that we should all be concerned about. Uh, uh, there's I've been discovering in, in my, my journey here that uh, there are a lot of these small boards, commissions, whatnot, that uh, have historically been on their own and uh, not really getting the kind of support that they should have from, from, from Minute. And, uh, and with some of these, you know, legislative carve-outs, I think we might need to come back and revisit some of them because uh, you know, we all care very much about uh, about a, uh, if there were a breach at the uh, campaign finance board, <laughs> as an example. <clears throat> Ms. Fast, um, why did it take so long at the, from the 2016 budget year? And again, I wasn't the chair at that time. I was on the committee. Just you got an increase. Why did it take almost a year or more to fill positions when you asked for a two million dollar increase that year? And I mean that's that's kind of what built up mm -hmm. this re this reserve that's here. And concerns I have with that go back to many many years ago in the school district that I that I went to, went to and that I that I currently represent part of. Um, they squirreled away money from all sorts of projects mm -hmm. that bonding issues and then they put it in a pot and then they built themselves an office building with that mm -hmm. which created a big uproar in the community because they, they didn't go to the voters to approve it where they have to go to the voters to approve a bonding issue um, and the, the and and they actually created a big turnover mm -hmm. that school board that next election because mm -hmm. they were not they were looked at as misappropriating funds mm -hmm. that were for one purpose that we used them for another now um, and that's what some of this, mm -hmm. like I said, that's what some of the concern is about. You know, like I said, again, last year we asked mm -hmm. about and the, the, the $21,000 or $20,000 to mm -hmm. reprogram to deal with the braiders. And yet at the end of the session, mm -hmm. after we're, we're gone, up pops this, you have ex, an extra $450,000 that you're planning for a project here. But, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have 21000 to spend over here. And it, it may not in the scope of our overall budget be a lot of money. Mm -hmm but it's a lot of money to our taxpayers. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, it, you know, there's a lot that's happened in my 13 years here and to try to remember the evolution of absolutely everything. You know, what I can kind of um, shed light on, and I think uh, Representative Elkins may have, um, you know, shed light a little bit on it. I, I mean, I remember coming and, um, you know, hearing about a board that, you know, is going to Office Max to get their supplies and, you know, what, how are we going to get them reimbursed? And I think, and I'm not... I'm not trying to deflect any blame. I'm the, I'm the executive director of the agency. I'm there to move it forward. I also have confines that I have to work within, which is whether it be Minute, it be the Department of Administration, it be Minnesota Management and Budget. But I think that, um, you know, as I sit here today, what I can really look at and say, you know, if I could go back and move to SMART, seven years ago or something to that effect, I think that that would have put us in a position of much more success. When you have one HR staff person servicing several hundred employees and they're supposed to, like, and it's not a person in our agency, it's someone in the administrative services unit, and they're supposed to um, 
service every vacancy, every employee problem, they quit. Um, there's a delegation that has to come from Minnesota management and budget in order to approve positions. And if Minnesota management and budget doesn't give that delegation to the HR staff person, it goes in a longer line of more people that need to approve things. And I think, um, you know, a lot of this, and frankly, I think I quit keeping track of all of the um, struggles we had with hiring. I just like would, I mean, we'd beat our head against the wall of like someone would quit, you know, or someone would leave or we'd need a position um, reallocated. I can tell you like my executive assistant needed her position reallocated and it took about a year and a half to get a response. Okay, it, it would take seven months to get a position approved. They might, there might be times we wouldn't even get positions approved because they couldn't come to an agreement on the level of the position. And so I think that um, I'm, you know, I'm one person. I attempt, I, I think the committee knows me, I, I tend to um, try to push things, you know, or I'm a driver. I'm not, I'm not one that just sits back and lets things happen. But at some point, I can't make HR finalize things when they're not will, not prepared or they that I'm I'm in the line of 200 other positions and so I think some of this goes to you know when the HR person quit it could be three more months till we got another new HR person with this in, in the smart model um, there's backups there's multiple they're servicing a lot more agencies and I think that that is some of the uh, the biggest reasons that we we struggled was the was navigating um, the position, getting the positions put in. Out of, I mean, we would submit them and out of our, you know, we'd wait, we'd sit, we'd submit them and we'd wait. And I think you would probably find that was common amongst all the health boards. I, I don't know if that satisfies your answer. I'm well, sorry. Well, if, 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 if there's problems with it, it, that process with admin, that's maybe something our committee should look at. But a lot of other boards go through this. And I understand just like a small business, a small agency when you lose one person in an office that's running it and, and you've only got three people there that's a bigger hit than if you've got a thousand people working for you and you lose one or two people um, it's easier to, to make up that but um, it, it, it just seems like I said it, it seems like positions weren't filled to build up a war chest or to build up a supply of money or a surplus of money and and that's our tax dollars and that's why they're supposed to go back to the general fund if if the at the end of the year if you budget for money and we give you the budget you ask for and then at the end of the year there's money left over um, I know my friends over here on the right I'll, I'll look at that as ex excess money that should go back to our taxpayers ultimately um, that's 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 the frustrating part about like I said especially at the beginning of the last session when, when the, with the 21 that that you didn't you said you couldn't afford and then we all of a sudden there's four hundred fifty thousand dollars sitting there in a pot um, Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, just for the record, I want to clarify that the struggles were when we were a part of the Administrative Services Unit, and we've had nothing but amazing service thus far from the Department of Administration. So I just want to make sure for the record that I'm not, uh, the two names are very similar, that we're not, um, I'm not pointing because I would directly talk to SMART if I had a pro I mean, we would be having conversations. So I just want to make sure that was clear. <clears throat> Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple quick questions. Um, how many, I'm, I'm looking at your, uh, your handout here. How many shops are you, or is, I guess I'm kind of confused. You have field inspectors. They go out, they inspect uh, physical brick and mortar stores. Is that what they do, or is this <coughs> virtual, or what? Explain. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, so yeah, we have field inspectors. There's about 5,500 salons uh, throughout the state, and they go and do routine inspections um, on all of the salons throughout the state. Ms. Uh, Representative Hewitt. Uh, Mr. Chair and to the testifier, you have a thing called mobile salons, is that correct? Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, yes, so that was uh, an initiative done by the Senate to have mobile salons. We may have one. They uh, would be like, um, you may have seen them on the news or uh, um, like they'll take a, con they'll convert a ice house, a fish ice fishing house and make it a salon. And so there's one, I think. Well, I'd have to pull the, I don't know, if, we don't know if there might be one, but there was, um, a, uh, there was, uh, it was Senator Rest, that was her initiative. Okay, Representative Hewitt. 
Mr. Chair, and so that's the, this has to do with this rule change that you had. Mm -hmm. I don't know the date on it, but it's back in, it's in, in your information here. And with these mobile salons, is this where we're really getting to with these, uh, uh, the, the, whatever we want to call it with the wedding cosmetologist, uh, cosmet I mean, is that, is that, do you understand where I'm going with this at all? Uh, the, the controversy I'm getting from many, many constituents is that they can't put their friends' makeup on at weddings. Miss Fast. Help me out here. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and Ms. members. And Miss um, Fast, I know there's a bill out there, and I know this, there's a bill in the Senate, and I know there's a bill in the House. We haven't heard it yet this year dealing with that. And um, I know that's, a big, that's going to be a controversy. We're all getting a lot of emails mm -hmm. about that and a lot of visits from people. Yeah, um, Mr. Um, am I good? Yeah, okay. go ahead, Ms. Fast. Mr. Chair, members, and on top of that, the board is also um, in law, getting sued related to this. So I do have to, I, I'm not trying to be difficult, but limit some of my testimony because we're, uh, okay. I, I, I don't think that this would be unfair to say that the, uh, the makeup artists or the emails and the conversations you're getting is a separate issue from mobile salons. I think they're two different different items. Last question. Representative Hewitt. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair and to the testifier, uh, just because I'm dealing with another board, <laughs> not like yours, but anyways, uh, in other states, you must know because you've been around long enough, in other states, do you, uh, how are these boards or uh, <coughs> do these come down through boards or do they come down under departments of health or do they have their own department within a state? Uh, just real quickly, tell me what you've, uh, naturally you went around the country and uh, can you tell me how these board or how is it normally a board or what is it? Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members, I think the ones you find that I would consider them like my peers that are the most successful, they're independent boards. The next would be um, there, and I could get statistics for you. I don't have them off the top of my head of how many are then a part of a larger department, like a department of regulatory and licensing, and then they would have, you know, a bunch under it, if that makes sense, and then they might have still a division head for that specific board. Um, and then I find that the ones that um, have the, the greatest challenges would be the ones that are probably advisory councils. They're not uh, full boards. Sorry, Thank Mr. You. Chair, I lied. One more. Oh. So you, you brought up an interesting point. Then. You, mis what, you misspoke. I did. And so I, what are the metrics on success yeah. in something like this? Ms. Fast. Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, I'm trying to think of how I'm, I don't know if I can answer that. Like what is, like what is the success of that? When I'm looking at my peers, I, the ones that, um, I don't want to say that have m more, uh, the ones that, m maybe it's like the ones that are more mm -hmm. focused on the de the, the um, department in so which they, or the, the profession in which they regulate, yeah. have more of a single lane of, of um, uh, whether it's experience or their, sort of their mission and their vision. And I think when, when I hear sometimes of the, like the more, um, uh, the agencies where we call them like super boards is just kind of a slang term, if you will, that there becomes to be, there becomes more, um, not that more layers is bad, it's that then you have, um, you have like a department head like myself that would be sending stuff up to a commissioner and then is it the commissioner or the board, you know, then is it an, an advisory council that kind of like, it becomes that then the, the commissioner level has to balance all of the professions and it's not necessarily a single lane. And what we meet, what like cosmetology might need might be very different from emergency medicine, but because they're together, they're now being, their interests are sort of combining. If that, I don't know if that's, if that's, it's complex. Thank you. Y yeah. <laughs> Representative Claiborne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, firstly, to the Deputy Commissioner, I want to say thank you for the work that you do uh, for MNIT. I am really excited about the progress that I'm seeing and the 
departments uh, drive to efficiency while keeping all of our systems up and running very well. So thank you for that. Um, to Miss, um, to our testifier, Miss Fast. So this is a topic that we're kind of dancing around mm -hmm. here this morning. So I'm just going to tell you what I've heard and then let you address the issue. Um, when a department comes to us and says we need this $21,000 immediately, and then we hear from constituents about expensive couches, mm -hmm. expensive promotional materials, uh, uh, paintings on the side of buildings, it it hits us hard as legislators. Mm -hmm. Why are these expenses occurring? Is that really the best use of the mm -hmm. dollars that people pay for their licensing fees? I think that's the elephant in the room. That's mm -hmm. not really being discussed. So, uh, you know, is a $10,000 couch the right answer? Or could something be purchased that would be, uh, have a long useful life that would cost less? It's those kinds of mm -hmm. questions that I think are really at the crux of this conversation this morning. So maybe you might want to address that. Ms. Fast. Yeah, you know, uh, Mr. Chair and members, and it does seem to be that this couch has caused some issues. Um, I'll first tell you, it's it's the it's like the size of three couches, so it's not one couch. Um, it fits, and so it's on the state contract. I went through the state purchasing, you know, um, ish, uh, 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 process. Um, the warranty on the couch is significantly longer than the average couch, so it's 12 to 14 years. Um, this, you know, the department has the Department of Administration has us use um, like Interium as the state vendor. They come in, they evaluate what you're doing, they look at the space analysis of like how many visitors, for example. So the couch, I would compare it very similar to what you might see at like a college, um, you know, like a. a a union or something similar because there's a lot of kids that come into our office. They walk all over our furniture. Um, they're, so it's a very uh, sim simplistic. I can tell you that we looked at it the other day. It doesn't look a day old. It has a 12 to 14 year warranty versus a three year war three or four year warranty of what the vendor said an average couch. They So we felt that um, not only would it be like three couches would have cost just as much to fit seat, seat as many people. We were also trying to in the in the front area, um, our licensees like to sit down and write uh, at tables and desks. They we they don't like kiosks. It's not the profession. They 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 like to hand do things when they come to our office. So we wanted to create where the couch actually could have a table next to it so they can sit down. So we also avoided other costs by not putting in kiosks, not putting in other chairs, um, like, you know, more, we'd have to have more if we wouldn't have done this. So I think that, um, I, I think that, I think that's a component, the sign on the outside of the building, um, people couldn't find us. The building entrance is on the back side, so the front of the building is on the back side. Um, we were there for quite a while without it. People were calling us. We were having our main line um, ask, you know, people calling, where are you? I can't get into the building. So the idea was was to attempt to guide them to the side. So um, I, I understand. I also look at my peers, um, other peers of mine and other boards that aren't under your jurisdiction. and. I seem to be within the same, um, <coughs> I'm doing the same thing my peers are doing. And so whether I, I need to reconsider, obviously these conversations give me pause to reconsider. Um, I, but I also like look to my peers in, as other executive directors and they're, uh, they're, they're doing similar, similar things. Um, potentially if purchasing was a little easier in some of the components, <laughs> we wouldn't be spending as much. But those are those are the confines we have to work within. So I don't know if that answers it, but I, I appreciate, I like that you're being direct and me trying to help understand that I don't think I'm going rogue. The board is fully aware of these purchases. Um, mm -hmm. They are, you know, they, so it's, it's not, I'm not doing this in a vacuum. Okay. Representative Claiborne. I, I do appreciate your answers and, um, it helps me to better be able to respond to my constituents when they ask these questions, so it's good to know that. And I understand also, too, that sometimes the most expensive pair of shoes is the one that you pay the least amount for. So I, I get it, and I, I appreciate your honesty and forthrightness in the answer. Thank you. Representative Hurtas. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, your comments uh, about the excess revenues and being transferred to the general fund and your reference to my friends on the right, I uh, share that opinion. I uh, consider us all friends here. But I think uh, in this committee, uh, I'm going to speak for myself, perhaps for some of the other members here, that one of the frustrating things for me is to see with regard to the licensing fees that are charged uh, for each uh, person who gets up in the morning and goes to work uh, seems to be coming more problematic and onerous in terms of the cost. Um, you heard me say the other day to the uh, Secretary Simon about the excess revenues that are being charged to register things at the Secretary of State and that the money just gets transferred to the general fund. The contractor recovery fee that just gets built up and the state legislature takes it and transfers it to the general fund. The uh, fact that 34% of all trades and occupations in Minnesota require a license to go to work in the morning. Uh, I view a lot of these things as enterprise funds, and we should only be charging or collecting the fees that are necessary to administer the program of licensing. And so when these excess revenues just flow to the general fund, it becomes a tax. And to that end, I agree that, you know, it should be returned to the people who are paying it. Uh, Representative Cleverin made a comment about the optics of of what our constituents say to us about how money is being spent and and um, <clears throat> uh, Miss um, and, and Gina here was was talking about procurement of sofas and it's the type of things like that when we have a general procurement office that it seems like we write specifications that have to be met that make things expensive you know the chairs that we used to sit on in these committee rooms were horrible but I don't know if they were so horrible that these chairs we're sitting on were worth $600 a piece to replace, nor the chairs in the House floor were more than $3,000 a piece to uh, have authentic looking chairs from its origin. Um, this is the kind of stuff going back to the days of the 80s and 90s when we heard about the $900 toilet seats at the Department of Defense. This is, this is the kind of stuff that our taxpayers get really agitated about. Uh, to a question, um, I somehow got immersed in this cosmetology barber board merger eight years ago and was uh, writing a letter to the governor on behalf of those who were contacting me. Um, and I just want to ask you how this has uh, been working out and whether it's really streamlined or efficient, you know, is efficient in any way. Uh, after the merger, uh, there certainly were appeals from some of your staff, uh, some of the names on this list to break it apart again mm -hmm. and let the barbers be the barbers and the cosmetologists be the cosmetologists. And I have a number of family members who made their way in the hair business. Uh, I think more than eight or nine of them uh, on my mother's side were all in the cosmetology uh, industry and or barbers. So. Um, I guess that's where I took an, an interest in it a little bit, but maybe you could make a comment about that. Ms. Fast, and I, my understanding is they were put together and now they're apart, the barber mm -hmm. and the cosmetology board, but Ms. Fast, I think I'll let you answer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. <clears throat> Chair and members, if my memory serves right, we were merged roughly in the 04 or 05, that was right before I began my tenure here, and then we split in roughly 2009, and uh, I think that while it was a unique um, process to be through that the legislature got it right and they splitting it apart was the best situation. I think it's, um, you know, there's over, we're close to 40,000 licensees in cosmetology and barbers are in that 2000 range. Um, you know, I get solicited advice all the time um, from other states of why it didn't work. Uh, Cause you will, if you look at your, uh, if you look at states, um, or if you're at conferences, you'll see that some of the boards are combining, and I always give my opinion, you know, my advice as to, as to why. I didn't think it worked, but I do think that the bar, it, it's, it, the, the both boards are, um, at least from an administration side, I don't go to the barber board meetings, that things are really happy with both. Representative Hurtas. Representative Kwong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I've got a few questions. So, you know, you do all but um, what, 847 
of the sites are inspected a year, it looks like, in inspections versus existing. Um, so you do a fairly good, uh, it, it's in the documentation. Yep, my staffer is going to bring it up to me. And, and so my question is, what is the average duration, or how long does it do take to do a uh, inspection of a salon in a school? This fast. And I'm looking, and I think we're, I, we've handed out the, uh, the report that we got yep. from the fourth quarter 2019, and uh, yep. that's existing schools, and, and there's yep. a set 36, and you inspected all 36 of them last, yep. last year. Um, yep. of the existing salons, yep. there's 5,400, almost 5,500, and you inspected 4,600 of them. Yeah. So it looks like your, your staff's getting, and they look like they're, they're doing their job and getting a turnover on them, so. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, to, to answer your question, I think that, so the schools, first of all, take longer. I believe they're more at about a half day or longer. Um, it depends on the size. Um, and we do schools, uh, twice a year we have a fall and a spring um, inspection and we break that into a physical inspection as well as a records inspection um, and we're really excited because we're going to be partnering with the um, we've been partnering a lot with actually the department of education because some of the um, the issues that they have uh, mirror some of ours and uh, we we're working um, as a collaborative the ex the salons it's really hard to say like how long a salon takes and I'm not trying to be evasive at all it's just that some salons you know there's um, two people in it but you could get um, you have to balance uh, you get a lot of chatty people you know they're they're some are really excited you're there and some are horrified you're there and so it you know it's trying to get the inspector to um leave a good impression do their job as well as educate you could get a really small salon that is, is really really dirty and you have to do a lot of education on the on site um you could go to a really large salon that um, has has it really has a very well documented process? Everybody knows exactly what's going on. You ask a few questions, they all get it. So, <coughs> I believe if I'm not mistaken, um, I think there's a goal of fifteen a week. So they're in the office all day Monday, and if we took four days and fifteen divided by into four, that would be about how many each inspector is doing a day, roughly. And, and some go higher and some go lower, but that's, I don't quote me on that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was curious as to the uh, duration. So it's an hour, two hours, uh, you know, that I was just curious about how long an average. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members, I would, I'll get back to you on that. I'll, my inspection manager isn't here. I would imagine it's less than an hour. Representative okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, because when I looked at the numbers, it became evident that, um, on average, less than three hours for the inspection, the transit, and the uh, writing of reports. And so I just wanted to, to understand, because I knew the schools would take mm -hmm. a little bit longer, and I, I'm just sort of gauging, you know, the manpower and, and the efficiency of, of what's happening, because this is all over the state. Some mm -hmm. of our representatives drive six, seven hours to, to get here, and if you're located, uh, how, do you just have the one office or do you have regional uh, places for the inspectors that are based out of? Ms. Fast. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, inspectors are uh, based locally. They come into the office every Monday. They don't have territories. They um, are re they're required to travel um, roughly 26 weeks a year. That is a part of the, when we're interviewing them, that that's a requirement. They also have a systematic process that they're not allowed to inspect the same zip code back to back. So um, someone like up in Crookston is not gonna get the same inspector every single time. We had done that and that doesn't always, um, that's not advantageous necessarily for the licensee. Um, <coughs> so they, um, they're not gonna drive to Duluth and do one inspection and then like go to Crookston. So they're in, um, they're in groupings uh, based on zip codes to be most efficient. Representative Kwan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, you know, I, I thought it would be good for the public to get a gauge or scaling of the uh, activity. You know, mm -hmm. licensing is one half, the other half is the inspections. Um, and uh, the last uh, 
uh, curiosity I have on the uh, you know the hair braiding and uh, when you add extensions and things and my understanding there were some sometimes there are hooks and other mm -hmm. things of where uh, you know there are concerns about uh, you know scratching mm -hmm. you know bleeding and stuff like that um, did you have any comments on that because we we from time to time hear about there needs to be more regulation or just uh, anything on that. I've had people mm -hmm. come to me asking for bills for uh, covering or breaking that off for uh, you know bloodborne pathogen mm -hmm. and the other safety concerns because it's just not uh, you know trimming hair. And Ms. Fast, I understand that that was one of our discussions last year, and the bill that took them out was because of the state they were sued, but the state was sued by hair braiders. The hair braiders won their suit to be de deregulated, and that's why they're deregulated. Um, and there, I know there's, even to myself, I got many emails from people that said we should, they should be regulated because of the issues that you pointed up. Well, and Ms. And Ms. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I probably could state it closer. Um, a lot of people might look at it being, tr cosmetology being trivial, but some of the questions have come up about uh, you know, more health directed. So if you can comment about, um, you know, things that you're teaching, bloodborne pathogen or, mm -hmm. you know, other things because you do have uh, sharp implements and, mm -hmm. and items that are utilized. I just... Yeah, Ms. Mr. Fast. Yeah, Ms. Fast. And I know, I know that's part of the... <laughs> um, again, There's, that's also there, part of what's yeah. going on with the current lawsuit, too, in my understanding. But... Yeah. Um, <laughs> There was an article I wish I could have read to you all that they were there was just talking about it's the scissors taken to someone's hair are sharper than a surgeon uses. Um, it's why I love being a hairdresser. I'm not a hairdresser. So this is the article why I love being a hairdresser and the chemicals and the math and the scientific components that they use in order to um, uh, apply these uh, products and keep people safe. Um, in terms of the hair braiders. Um, you know, it was only a registration the my entire tenure. It was, um, the lawsuit happened prior to my arrival. And what I testified to last year and was that because it was uh, only a registration, we were not able to inspect. We were not able to really have any sort of, we had no oversight, legislative oversight over braiders that I could not provide any sort of um, background or statistics as to injuries resulting from it. Oh, um, my understanding is that there's hot water used, there are some sharp um, tools being used, but we were not the agency that would collect any um, public, or we would not collect any complaints, nor could we go into a braiding establishment and inspect them for infection control. And I would say from, you know, uh, regardless of what profession, be it you're going into a barbershop, tattoo, cosmetology, that, you know, infection control, continuous infection control and keeping people uh, doing that is, is so important. If I get a bad haircut, you know, hair grow, well, generally, hair is going to grow, right? Um, but so it's a little, I'm, I'm not really that, I can't totally answer your question because it was never under the Board of Cosmetology's oversight. Representative Kwam. Uh -huh. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Fast, I think um, as uh, Ms. the members around the table have uh, shared with you, um, there is a frustration with the maybe the communication that we've realized uh, from your organization over several years. Um, and I think this is more, I don't think there's going to be a question. There might be. Um, but I think it has to do more with, you know, you talked about your mission vision. And, and from my perspective, a board of examiners isn't about public relations. It's more about regulatory and establishing best practices. But when you go to the extent of uh, issuing an RFP for a marketing agency, or you spend $1,000 on sugar cookies, or you expend uh, sizable amounts of money on office renovations and furniture. We're not in the business, my opinion, of 
providing a, 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 a living room at atmosphere when they come into your office. You're regulatory. You're inspecting people. Um, I know of a number of SROs that would look at what you're doing and say, maybe the, the, the people that are paying the fees should have a greater level of input in terms of how their dollars are expended because mm -hmm. they're taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. Just like we are representing the taxpayers that, mm -hmm. you know, send us here. Um, so I, I think it's, it's not very un, it's not very common either for an agency to be sued. I hope that doesn't become a regular pattern. Uh, you have a fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. You are a steward of the budget that we appropriate to you. To suggest that variances in your employee base or the regulatory environment about purchasing furniture, as a couple of examples, have exacerbated the problems that you've uh, faced, I think runs counter to the mission vision that you're responsible for. So what I'm asking you to maybe comment on, as Representative Claiborne and others have intimated, is with all that we've said and articulated here, how do you make remedy or justification for those expenditures being in line with the regulatory appropriateness of making sure that cosmetologists are being in, being inspected, regulated, and talked about best practices, that's your job. Mm -hmm. Help me understand why the conversation that we've had for the last hour and a half fits and comports with that mission vision. Ms. Uh, so, <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members, to kind of shed light a little bit on the RFP, so we had a group of people come to, I think it was the December of 2018 uh, board meeting, and they had some questions, and so uh, we wanted to give them more time, not just at the board meeting, so we offered to uh, meet with them individually, and there was about 15, 15 of them that had offered to come, or had wanted to come, and they our licensees were the ones that asked the board to do more public relations, more Instagram, more Facebook, more on the platforms that they follow and that they are on. So it was uh, directly related to licensee input, their money, you know, they're the ones that pay the license fees for us to do this. Um, I look at my counterpart in the state of Florida where there's Ramp, like rampant unregulated services, her budget for marketing a year, now granted they have probably 100,000 licensees, is $3 million. So when I'm going to national meetings and compare and looking at my peers and, 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 um, and, and soliciting ideas as all directors go to national um, different um, organizations, we're collaborating on what is working, what is working in your state, what are things um, that you're doing. California has a big initiative of License California. Um, their legislature is working with their cosmetology board as well, um, trying to educate consumers about why licensing is important, um, why going into a salon and, you know, you go to a doctor and you want them to wash your hands, but you might not ask a cosmetologist to do it. And they're touching you in very intimate, you know, whether it's your fingers or whether, you know, you might have an open sore. So it wasn't just me sitting back and saying, how, what should I do? Um, licensees asked for it. And the reason we went out for a bid instead of hiring a full-time staffer is we, and we were looking at the balance of, if I get one voice in, one mind in, maybe they're only good in Facebook. Maybe they're not good in Instagram. And maybe, it, maybe it's not a good initiative. And then I'd, have, then I'd likely lay someone off. So we were trying this as a, as a test <clears throat> to see, our licensees asked for this? Let's give it a shot. Let's see what we get from it. If it's successful, then maybe it's something we continue. If it's not successful, 
then we aren't invest. We don't have layoff costs. We don't have uh, staffing costs, as well as having um, a group. And now, mind you, when like every presenter came in for the RFP, I can't tell. Every single one of them had worked with plenty of state agencies of all different size and shapes. So when I looked at the response, when I was sitting in with my team. I seem to be in a mirror of other state agencies. Like, again, I wasn't alone. It wasn't just the board doing this independently. And so um, I, saw, I, I see where you're coming from. Uh, I, I, I'm hearing you, and I'm, I, I'm processing it. I also am not, I also feel like I'm not just doing this on a whim or, um, you know, at, at a, like just on my own. I mean, we're, I, I, I'm, I'm highly respected amongst all of my peers nationwide. The Minnesota board is looked at often as the pillar of a state regulatory board and what we're doing. Um, you can talk to other, um, you can talk to manufacturers. They say, go look at rules. They'll say, go to Minnesota. So I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling in this like back and forth of the people that collaborate with us on a on a daily basis are seeing the value in what we're doing for our licensees, where we're going for the public. And and then I have the other side, which is, you know, but criticism's good. I'm here to hear it. I'm here to absorb it. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. You got, you know, there's always new players coming into this, and we all can learn from each other. So I'm not opposed to saying I know it all, um, but I think that we are trying to listen to our licensees. You know, I'm whole, we we were this public forum is also continuing. Um, we're hosting one at the end of March, and it's kind of like what we were hoping to get people who are quieter to come in and to be able to have know that we're and we're, we're open. We're here to be of help. And um, I don't see any other boards that I know of. None of my peers are holding public engagement sessions just for fun. But I'm getting criticized because I'm only allowing 25 people in the room instead of 30,000. So I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm trying. I'm putting out where the board's putting themselves out there. Um, we're trying to intake. We're trying to listen. And if we need to listen more and get more from you all, we're here to do it. So I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I, Thank you, Ms. Vast. Mm -hmm. Representative Allwright. Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I wanted to express general support for uh, Representative Hurtas's basic proposition that the license fees ought to be treated like enterprise funds. And I'm wondering some of the questions, I guess, to anyone in the room who can answer it, but is there uh, any kind of a, a general process through which we could, you know, review on a biennial basis the adequacy of, of the funds and make adjustments. I mean, we, we see them when they come through the, the budgeting process in the, uh, uh, in the odd years, but uh, it, it, it seems like there ought to be a regular process for reviewing the adequacy of the fees and, and adjusting them. Uh, well, I'm... I'm Representative Elkins, I know that we set, a lot of places we set those fees, and mm -hmm. the judgment is that when we set them is, okay, is this adequate? Mm -hmm. And I know some board, other boards that have come before us, they, they haven't raised their fees for years, and then they drop low, and they're, and they're not taking in the money to mm -hmm. cover their, what their operations are. I think Ms. Ms. Roberts has some information here from that we do get, and it does, some of that stuff does get tracked, so. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, members, as part of the, biennial budget um, process and the governor's submission every two years. We do get a document that's called the Departmental Earnings Report, and um, I can pass you the page. So it's a fairly lengthy report, but for each agency or board that collects fees, you, it will show you um, what their projected revenues are. It will provide some narrative on um, what those fees and, um, are and what the source is. In the case of this board, the fees are set in statute. As, is, that's the general. Um, approach. Um, I think we would have to talk a little bit more on the history because there's the, the report is a relatively short history and it looks right now that the board's um, revenues versus their general fund appropriation is fairly close, although it's varying from year to year. Um, there were significant changes made to the board's appropriation and to the fees in 20, the 2015 session, so that may 
that history may look a little bit different. But um, we're certainly, I can provide this to any, to the members, and it's available um, for, for the finance committees to look at. And, and Ms. Roberts, I looked at that in Representative Elk's, I looked at that uh, just, just, just a little while ago here as we were talking in the, in the meeting here. And uh, it, like you said, it looks like they're, at current level, Representative Hurtas, that they're, their fees are matching. They're not overly charging. They're not building up a lot of excess fees that way. Representative Elkins. Yeah, it's fine. Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks for that comment, uh, Representative Elkin. I, I think um, a lot of what we see going on, and, and it's perhaps anecdotal at best right now in terms of what I'm commenting on, but I hear a lot of it from whether it's school boards or school districts, um, the idea that budgets are set and appropriations come. Uh, there's this tendency to expend the budget because you don't want to see the next appropriation for the next biennium cut or reduced. And <clears throat> should the money always be returned to the general fund if you don't use it? Perhaps that's the responsible thing, but maybe there ought to be some incentivization to allow like a board like this to maybe retain uh, up to 5% or to maybe a maximum of 10% of funds to carry forward into the next year so that we can have greater stability uh, with regard to license fees, not knowing necessarily how many people might renew their license, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it seems counterproductive uh, to simply uh, have budgets that get expended <coughs> because they want to be assured that they'll get the same level of funding in the next biennium. And I, I think that's one of the issues that the legislature has never really addressed over many bienniums. And Representative Hurtas, there's, I know the governor's office and some of those, his departments, the executive branch have, I think last year in their budget request, so what they had, they were asking for some carry forward so they didn't have the big ups and downs and, and they didn't, you know, some of the what people would call games of not hiring people to build up a reserve, not filling positions when someone leaves to help build up a reserve so that you can take care of projects and stuff going forward uh, might not occur if they had this carry forward so they could they could you capture some of that and not have the ups and downs in their budget. So that's that's a discussion we'll have going forward because mm -hmm. I, I believe the governor has i will probably request that again. Representative Hurtas. Thank you. If no one else is on the list, I did have one more question. There's, you, you're the last person on the list. All right, thank you. So Representative Hurtas. There's a number of um, chain-type places where people go get their haircuts. I won't name names. Mm -hmm. I visit one of them regularly. Um, as a past healthcare practitioner, one of the things that's disturbing to me is the lack of hand washing between customers. I sit there and wait for my turn and I see the booth gets swept up and the next person comes to the counter and is seated and right away uh, start doing a procedure. And I think it's partly because maybe even the design requirements don't require a, a sink or a basin nearby. Uh, oftentimes you see people disappear between customers into the back room. You don't know what they're doing. If, if they need to use the restroom or whatever, that's fine. But I think there would be some consumer confidence uh, elevated if, if as uh, new facilities come online, uh, that there should be uh, conveniently located some hand washing stations. The best control against in, uh, spread of infectious disease is hand washing. And, um, you know, it'd be a little reassuring. I know you inspect to make sure that combs and brushes are sanitized between <coughs> customers, but, you know, when one person's hands is in someone else's hair and they go right to your head, uh, you don't know what's being transferred to you. So uh, I'd like, yeah. like you to do better effort on that <laughs> front. Ms. Fast. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, I always say when I leave this job, my husband's going to buy me a gold sink because sinks are have been the probably one of the largest thorns in the board side since about 08. And sinks become a extremely expensive um, item to add to facilities, right. be it a uh, new build, a uh, rebuild. And so the board had placed um, in our rule through our rulemaking sink requirements. And 
an example would be when you use the word convenient, rules have to define what convenient is because then you get into interpretation. So people can come for waivers of sinks. Uh, we, and we've heard every story of, I can't even open the business because you're gonna make me put a sink in. And so there is this, this sink issue, um, it, it's, 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 it's been, a, been a tough one. <coughs> um, there, uh, there's now uh, the rules. I think they go, they go into the. There's a modification that goes into effect on the second of. I think it's March, um, that will allow for uh, if you after you wash your hands, and you you can use um, hand sanitizer. And there's a specific one, um, but I would love to discuss with you if you have the magic solution for sinks because we continuously try to find one. Um, without overburdening businesses because that's, we typically then they'll come to the board and they'll have a $10,000 plumbing, you know, estimate and they can't open and then they call you all and then we're getting told that we're being too overburdensome. So again, I sit in a spot of sometimes a rock in a hard place and trying to explain these or trying to figure out what the best solution. Rule making is always open to the public. We ask for comments. Um, but the sinks, I think I'm gonna at some point when I say like when I say when I leave this job, that is going to be I will be <laughs> the sinks are a problem. I don't know what the best solution. I mean, part of it is just your own initiative as well as um, consumers saying, Why didn't you wash your hands? Represent her time. Well, I know in the in the food service industry, um, filed <laughs> with it, it depends whether you're in the wholesale food in preparation or retail by uh, two different jurisdictions. One is Department of Health, one is Department of Agriculture. Depends who you are and where you are, what you do, but uh, <coughs> they often have uh, on file a, uh, a floor plan uh, mm -hmm. of the facility. And if there's a change to the floor plan, uh, that has to be approved. And I'm not suggesting that suddenly uh, by the stroke of a wand that everybody's gotta have a, a sink. But what I am suggesting is that going forward, you know, maybe a lot of places are grandfathered in, but going forward as these salons uh, remodel their facilities or update or do things uh, or new ones coming online, that that, you know, be part of the requirement to have a, a hand washing station. You know, typically you walk in these places and there'll be three or four booths here and three or four booths there. And just having one single hand washing station in that area uh, is accessible without having to leave the area. I don't know what that definition is, but I, I think I think you could start to establish uh, some procedures going forward so that eventually over time we move in that direction rather than just ignoring it. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your time. If, if you. you have anything more that, as far as any other part of your or of this presentation, or are we? Are we done here? <laughs> Mr. Chair and members, um, you know, I just want to say I thank you all um, for your time and um, listening to us. I know it's you have valuable time. And um, if people have concerns, feel free to meet with me, call me, you know, schedule me with my chair or the board. But I'm happy we could have this today and get through <clears> some <throat> of the, the, the struggles. And Ms. Fast, I hopefully next session when we start over again and we start our new budget for, ne for the next biennium, that uh, we, you, we can get a good update on, on how things are going with this project and, and where we're at, and hopefully it's up and running and running perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with that, members, uh, when our next meeting is, is Tuesday at 8 a.m., so members, we're adjourned. <coughs>